Sexton trying to get loose. He'll fire. He knocks it down. Burrow slams it home. Garland upstairs. Oh! Sexton inside. A thunderous dunk. And Allen blocked the shot at the rim. Welcome to the Chase Down Podcast, part of the Cavs Media family. I'm your host, Justin Rowan. Strong performances from Darius Garland, Colin Sexton, and Isaac Okoro was not enough to overcome the South Beach losing streak. That is 20 consecutive losses for the Cavs in Miami. Those damn triard heat. They don't take a night off. It's almost like they play with a little added motivation against Cleveland for some reason. Wonder what that's about. But yeah, I wonder what that's about. Uh, But we don't let L get in the way of a good time or a good podcast. And we got a great one for you today. With me today is my co-host, Carter Rodriguez. Carter, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, Justin. Uh, it's Easter Sunday. Had a nice morning with uh, with the kid. Did a little Easter egg hunt. Uh, I am fully suburban. I am fully washed. So I did have a couple <laughs> drinks while she napped. So you know, I'm, I'm feeling oh. good. <laughs> N- nice, nice to hear that you're inebriated for this podcast. But <laughs> we we got a really special one. We we got some guests here to help carry the load. Two guests that need no introduction, but I'll do it anyways because that's <laughs> podcast tradition. Uh, the voices of the Wine and Gold Radio podcast. First, we got Cavs.com beat writer Joe Gabriel. Joe, how's it going today? It's going really well, but I mean, I wish Carter would have told me ahead of time that I could have gotten drunk for the show. Well, just a couple, <laughs> just a couple, fellas. I mean, it's a it's a lovely sunny day. We're sitting out on the front porch. Oh, there we go, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's it's going great, guys. It's going great. Thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. It's gonna be oh. fun. This is an absolute honor. And the other voice uh, that Carter just alluded to there, a man who is calling his fourth consecutive NCAA Final Four, Spanish play-by-play announcer Rafa Hernandez Brito. Rafa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, guys. And, and, you know, I have so many things. I have a list of things I have to go over with you guys. Let me know if there's a suggestion (laughs) box, there's a complaint (laughs) box, or there's, you know, a comments box. But I got plenty of those in all those three lists. And I, I agree with with Carter, salute and happy Easter to everybody. Wonderful country America is that makes a Catholic holiday and I make hunting holiday. But hey, <laughs> I make everybody happy. So happy Easter. Uh, uh, Rafa, happy bunny day. <laughs> Rafa, what would you say is a bigger honor uh, doing the final four or coming on this podcast? Oh, for sure, coming on the podcast. I mean, That's what I thought. It, 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 there's no question about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of figured that was the case, but I'm, I'm glad we got that clarity. I do actually want to start on the Final Four because it, it's fresh in everybody's mind. And and who wants to talk about another loss in Miami? Uh, I, I do. I, wanna... <laughs> I do. Because they, I, I, I'm not saying I'm happy the Cavs lost. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of happy that they didn't win when I wasn't there because they would have blamed it on me in the losing streak. That it was, oh. that it's, it's me because I couldn't do the Cavs game last night because I wasn't doing the Final Four. So if they have won the game, then I'm sure Joe G and Joe Michael would have said it was me, like the, the bad omen there. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a really good point. Maybe Larry and uh, Jared Allen were sitting out in solidarity trying trying to help you out. <laughs> I, I do need to know, though, because, Rafa, you called one of what's probably going to go down as one of the more iconic NCAA games that we've seen in uh, just a fantastic tournament. And uh, Carter shared your call earlier on Twitter today. I just need to get your thoughts. Like, stream of consciousness, what was going through your mind in those final minutes there uh, from the end of the fourth quarter throughout overtime? You know, it was an amazing game, and that thing, that's what I'll remember the most out of everything. I know the buzzer beater is what everybody remembers, but those 45 minutes of basketball play at, at Lucas Oil Stadium was just an incredible amount of basketball, just good talent, people racing the game, well coached. So and over, overall, I can I, again, you know, I don't remember what came out of my mouth until this morning when my phone was going crazy with all the notifications and I had to listen to the play. And 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 what was going to my mind was just like literally thankful to, to have the opportunity to be witnessing such an amazing game. I've been to a few that have been great games. I've watched, obviously, you know, we all we're all familiar with the Leitner call and and you know the the way the way Villanova beat UNC in 2016, and everybody forget that was a buzzer beater in the championship game. So it, it is just great. I, I I just was happy to know and to realize again that March Madness leaves, and this was the only championship that was canceled because of the pandemic, and and we're just lucky to have it back. I mean, I don't care what anybody says about college basketball and what the NCAA they, they behave as a cartel or whatever you want to say about it. 
But the tournament, it is the best month of sports in, 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 the, in the whole year. I don't care what anybody says. It, it really is. And I, it's kind of unfortunate. So this has probably been, I, I know how great this tournament is, but at the same time, I feel like I've watched less of this year than other years, just because of how condensed the NBA schedule is and how crazy it is. Often we're recording podcasts on off nights. I try to catch highlights or watch condensed games wherever I can. Uh, but Joe, we were talking before the podcast about just how how nice it is to have this opportunity where you get to see these players before the draft again. Uh, the NBA announced that the draft lottery is set on June 22nd, the draft on July 29th. But compared to last season, where not only did we have a nine-month layoff, we didn't get any opportunity to see the championship game. What, what are some of your impressions from watching the tournament and, and seeing all these up-and-coming players? Well, I mean, Justin, you're right in that uh... – Last year, you, you, well, you got cheated, and they got cheated. The play, mm-hmm. I mean, the players are so horrible that they weren't part of this great thing. Uh, but this year, again, uh, we were talking before the show, Johnny Ju, uh, Johnny Juzang, right? Mm-hmm. There's a guy who, again, who, who went from an unknown now to uh, whatever, <laughs> wherever he's going to go in the draft. I mean, guys raise their stock during this time of year. This is when guys – you know, the, the cream rises to the top. And again, Jalen Suggs would have been a high pick anyway, but he might have elevated himself to the top of the draft, you know, and why? Because of what he did in the tournament, when it counts, when it matters, this is when, you know, if you're going to talk about being a pro and winning games, this is where scouts want to see it at the highest level against the best competition. So it, it's been great. I, I think this has been the best tournament in years and maybe it was last year not being there, but it, it's been great. And I'm so glad Rafa was able to, to make like you said, an iconic call. And I can't. Wait Monday night. Yeah. It, it's- and you know what I think guys is everybody's going to remember the, 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 the buzzer beater at the end of the first overtime, right? But, but Jalen Suggs had a block shot on Cody Riley to keep the Zags with striking distance and then picked up the loose ball and threw the almost half-court bounce pass to Kispert to lay, to lay it up. I mean, that, is, that to me is one of the plays that people are going to forget about. And it's just an amazing, an amazing play, an amazing display of talent. And you mentioned Juzang, or, you know, Jaime Hackes, who is a guy who is now – has it on his shoulder, they're representing the Latino community, playing for UCLA, the first Latino to play in UCLA, Sin Lorenzo Matas Real played, played in the 80s and won three final fours and, and, and went to three final fours. But every, everything that, that, that happens in March Madness just, just has a, it's like on a, on a magnifying glass and the guys that are able to put up with that pressure and, and come up and, and raise their game are just the guys that, that we're all going to remember. I got it. I could finish my. Yeah, go if ahead. I can make my last point. Just uh, I was going to say about Rafa brought up the Jalen Suggs play. Just real quick, uh, what elevated him even more maybe than that last shot was that play, where he had that incredible block, came down with the ball, threw the half court skip pass. That was uh, again. That's a pro play and at the highest level. So. Great play. Yeah, I mean, that that's a kid who plays definitely beyond his years. And, like, you keep looking at this draft class, and it just gets tastier and tastier. Like, normally I feel like you're looking at the top of the, even a stack draft where you go, okay, this is supposed to be a five-man draft, but I don't really believe in player X or player Y. And you look at all these guys, you know, Cade looks like an absolute stud. Suggs looks like an absolute stud. Um, you know, Kuminga uh, on, on the G League team. It, it's an absolutely, like, just a filthy draft class. And I, <laughs> I'm not surprised that a lot of teams seem to be pushing back towards, like, you know, like we, we thought, you know, the, the league hoped that uh, these new draft odds would, would stop tanking. But I think with a class like this, you're never going to not see it. Yeah, I think maybe in a a different year, uh, there might be teams that kind of recognize that, hey, we could throw away our entire season and we have a 48% chance of picking fifth. Like normally that's scary. Like that's a freaky prospect. And we've done a lot of complaining about the new lottery odds and how far you can fall. We we, we like to sit here and complain a lot on this (laughs) podcast. But uh, like when you talk about a five player class like this, and yeah, there are a lot of really good prospects outside of that top five but man it sure looks like a sure thing for a lot of these top guys 
I think you guys should make a bet that if anybody, if for some reason we end up with Drew Timmy, you, you three should like shave the stash of Drew Timmy just to celebrate, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I don't think... I don't, I don't I, have I, it enough to do it, but hey. But I, listen, I really hope Rafa. we don't fall to the second round. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that might be what uh, that would require. I, I know uh, the odds we, are bad, Rafa, but I don't, I don't we, think I don't think that we can fall that far. We, no. we, we did play a game. We did play a game where I was forced to take shots live on the podcast for every spot we fell back in the lottery. So, I mean, it's only like you're you're only risking four shots. So it, to me, yeah. that was fine. But before I, I, we I, sold out, we yeah. probably can't do that anymore now. <laughs> I, I we can was, see. We can see. I was going to ask you, Rafa, you know, with a crazy call like that, how much of it is just pure stream of consciousness? You said you didn't remember what you said till the morning. Is it just straight up like I'm just reacting live? Because the way the play played out, you know, normally you get a big stoppage where you get to like collect yourself, but you didn't get that on this play, right? You don't. You, and I almost missed it because of what happened and the way we were sitting up because Kisper played the ball, he put the ball inbound immediately after the offensive rebound by Juzang and, and, you know, and the bucket to tie it up at 90. But, you know, those are the plays that you cannot prepare for. You can't prepare, for example, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm preparing how I'm going to finish tomorrow in case Baylor wins or how I'm gonna, what I'm going to say tomorrow in case Gonzaga wins because those are the goals that are definitely, like, it happened to, you know, John Michael and I were preparing before the 2016 Game 7, and we kind of, the night before, we kind of say to ourselves, you know, if we win, whatever comes out of our mouths at the end of the game is going to be here for eternity. So, you know, which way are you going to go? And John said, well, you know, we're going with the, the drought being over. I'm going with, you know, LeBron fulfilling the promise of taking the calf to the, to the promised land. So those are the things that you can plan for, but there's no way that you can prepare for, for, for what happened at the end of overtime last night. And again, I don't remember, I, I couldn't remember what I said until I got to my, to my hotel room. And, and I was laughing because there was a DM on my Twitter from a fan from UCLA telling me that I had turned his tears, his fear, his tears of sadness to cracking up because <laughs> what came out of my mouth was, you know, midnight has, the clock has struck midnight for Cinderella. <laughs> And Jalen Sock just said goodnight to UCLA with the triple at the buzzer. So that's what I was feeling. And I think that's the greatest thing about sports. And if you listen to all the calls in whatever language it is, there is definitely proof that there's one word that means the same in any language when you're watching sports, which is every call has a whoa! <laughs> from, from, and there's not that, those are the calls where it is allowed for the color guy to freak out before the play by play guy finishes call because there's no <laughs> way you can keep your composure when you see when you witness something like that. And I do think this is one of the one of those spots where it's really clear what gets added by having you at the game. You know, I'm I'm sure that uh, there's been a lot of remote calls uh, in your in your uh, life this last year, and it's just not the same when you're not there, right? It's not, but I'm telling you, the quality of the game is what That's erases fair. everything. Mm -hmm. There's no way that, and the fact that I don't care who won or lost. First of all, the Cavs were not in it, and Michigan was not in it. Yes, I'm a Michigan fan. I mean, <laughs> and 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 the fact that it wasn't UCLA being buried with the triple. So I mean, Ohio State wasn't buried being buried with the triple. So I couldn't celebrate either way. But you witness something that is is it is literally immortality for Jalen Suggs. It's literally immortality for Gonzaga, who's still looking to be even more immortal, be winning and being perfect. So I, I don't think it has anything to do with being there or not, because I'm sure anybody watching, wherever it was, whether it was in, in Brentwood or Spokane or anywhere in the U.S. or in the world, everybody had that same reaction at the end of the game. And I think that's the job as a broadcaster, because you're watching the game for everybody, for everybody mm -hmm. that cannot watch it. I'm, I'm, you know, for the radio and, and, and the, the, the feeling, my our producer ran out of the booth when he saw that, and he's not even a fan of either of the team, but I just saw a person running over to it <laughs> and then run back to watch what was going on. You know, so it, it, it was unbelievable. It was unreal. It, it really, really, it, un those moments they they just transcend all words like you said the the exuberance and, and just the it, yelling out in moments like that is universal but uh transitioning from guys that are making those moments in ncaa to the guys that are trying to make a mark in the nba joe I, i'm curious to get your thoughts now that we're basically i guess three quarters of the way through the season uh who among the Cavs kind of young core the guys that uh are trying to make an impression this season and and long lock in their spots in the NBA. Who stood out the most to you uh, among that group? 
Well, I mean, am I allowed to go with, uh, as far as, that's a tough question. Are you saying young core as far as everybody or young core? Um, of, of the young guys. So I would say Sexton, 23 or Gar younger. Yeah. I, I'm going to cut Larry out of the equation just for this. Uh, yeah, as much as he is still part of that young group, but uh, of the guys that have been drafted in the last couple of years, we'll say. Uh, well, again, I, as much as I love our guards, as much as I love both those guys, Jared Allen right now is absolutely the most impressive and integral piece of our future, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, I hate to categorize it. Sure. Also, he's an impressive young player, and he's really big for our future. He's, I, I he's feel like he plays older than the other guys. The other guys, you feel I their agree. youth. And, and with Jared, you pretty much know what you're getting on a night-to-night -night basis, and that's not something that you can say for a lot of the members of this team yet. Yeah, and again, and again, he's 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 good on both ends. He's solid. He's consistent. Uh, he's a great guy, a great teammate. I, it seems like, uh, yeah. I, I, again, as much as I love our guards, as much as again, Okoro was excellent. I'm sure we're going to talk about that later mm -hmm. uh, last night. Um, but yeah, Jared Allen right now, uh, I think, is just the most uh, uh, is a very key piece for our future. Yeah, I. I... I was a big fan of him in Brooklyn and uh, he was somebody that I was pining for as I, I mean, I do pine Justin for pines. about half the league. Yeah, I, I do that. It's, I am known to pine every now and then, um, <laughs> but just how seamlessly he's fit in with everybody. Like that's, that's the encouraging thing. Like you can have your opinions on who kind of stands out the most, who impresses you. And usually that's kind of based off your expectations as well. But the fact that all these young guys fit together so well, it, it's really, it's nice to see, but, at the same time, it also drives me a little bit crazy. And, and maybe it wouldn't drive me crazy if we didn't have nine months off and I'm just still so grateful to have NBA basketball back. But it is wild to me that you have these four guys, all 22 and younger, and the perfect piece to go with them is Kevin Love. And at this point in the season, we're, we're basically 50 games in. They have played a total of two minutes together. And like, I'm, I'm just, I'm jumping at the bit. I, I want to see more of these guys with Kevin Love because I, I just feel like he's such a difference maker. I thought you were talking about the young guys. <laughs> <laughs> he's young at heart. He's young Listen, at heart. You've seen saying, his vacations. There's a saying in Hispanic that applies to Jared Allen. We always say that there's a person of sweet blood. It doesn't matter where you put Jared Allen right now. In the other 2019, he's going to fit in. He's going to mm. add to a team. And he's going to just be liked by everybody and just improve the quality of, the, of, of what's going on in the locker room. But in, when you talk about the young guys, you know, yes, you know, Okoro, Garland, Sexton, and everybody. But I like to, I like to think of Lamar Stevens and Dean Wade, who mm. are guys who weren't even supposed to get an opportunity if it wasn't for injuries, if it wasn't for for what the moment, the days that we're living in. And, and, and those guys have really stepped up. And, and, and they, they are the, the proof that in the NBA, 1 to 15 can actually play and they're actually talented. All they need is the consistent minutes. Tim Wade is getting them right now. Lamar Stevens is just showing that it doesn't matter if he gets, the, if he gets his name called in five minutes to go in the game or five minutes after the game started. He's going to come in and, and really – you know, have an impact in, in, in the game. And the last couple of games, I didn't watch last night, obviously, but the two games before that, he actually, with, with Allen and Nance being out, he came in to guard Dwight Howard. He came in to guard the center on the other team. And, and I just like the energy that he puts in and he brings into the game. He's like a piston, you know. He, he just really brings everybody up when, when, when he's on the court. Yeah, I think, I think those are the kind of players that you just didn't really see, like, happen for this team uh after decision 1.0 like it was just like i mean sure you had like a, a brief run of jeremy pargo or and these these role players who would just kind of flash in the pan but like they didn't they weren't able to find any of these like real second round or late first contributors mm -hmm. or even undrafted players like dean wade like you know justin always talks about how they want to model the, this is an organization that wants to model itself as a, after a miami or a toronto and those are organizations that find value uh, where it's not going to be found, where it's hard to hard to find it. I feel like, you know, especially a guy like Dean Wade, like Lamar, like, he, you know, his limitations are there right now. You know, he can't shoot. We know this, uh, or at least not at, not at any sort of volume that's going to draw out a defender. But Dean Wade's playing starters minutes and really acquitting himself pretty well. I mean, he was icy as can be against Miami, but 
you know that you're going to have those games as a, as a stretch big, especially against a team as professional and capable as Miami with uh, you know smart vets like Ariza and Adebayo on you. But you know I, I've just been so impressed by Wade, and I feel like you know this is a guy who probably doesn't even have a spot in the rotation once they get fully healthy. Uh, if not, you know a fringe one, probably competing with Hartenstein for backup four or five minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, they've, they've been really, really fun, but I will, I do want to go back to what Justin was talking about, about Kevin Love's return and about how things start to make sense with him on the floor. Um, you know, like is, this is a team that even with Nance, who's kind of a nominal shooter, he's not someone who teams are flying at to run off the line, whereas Kevin Love is, and it makes, it makes having a non-shooter at the three, as well as two guards who maybe don't like to pull from three as much as we thought they would uh make a lot more sense and i that that's been so jarring to me is that even when love isn't putting up crazy numbers he just raises the offensive floor of this team by like a hundred percent yeah yeah he, he really does I, I and, think, and to, to oh go ahead joe well i was just gonna say uh look I'd, everyone would love to see kevin score 30 points a night mm-hmm. but the fact is if kevin uh hits his first two or three three pointers that changes the game immediately uh, right away, it stretches the floor. They know, you know, uh, Carter just brought it up a minute ago. You know, they have to run him off that line or they have to get him. They have to they have to defend him at that line. That, and he's a great passer, as we know. Uh, I, I, I joked to Justin uh, that I saw. It changes the whole offense. I, I, saw, I joked to Justin that I saw my first skip pass in three months <laughs> when he came <laughs> back on the floor. <laughs> he, and he went window had- last night, which was really nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He, he's just got so much confidence. Like what's interesting to me, and it's it's a nice reminder too, because so many of these young players, like Garland, this in a lot of ways, this is still kind of his rookie season because he was cut short last year. He was never fully healthy. And now he's kind of figuring out what his limitations are. You see, sometimes he'll try an adventurous pass that may result in a turnover, but it's in the process of figuring out what you can and can't get away with now that he is fully healthy. And it's funny to see those young players because they've been so young for so long this season with all the injuries to see a, a veteran and a pro like Kevin Love come in there where when he pump fakes, you can tell he's got immediately, he's ready for the overhand pass, two hands. He's reading the defense as he's pump faking. And a lot of th- these young guys, like they have their move, but they haven't really established those counters. And, and it's just so refreshing to see him out there. And it- it's easy to forget that this team, which a-, a lot of people only project for 20 wins this season, um, they've got 17 w- without Kevin Love being out there. And, and without Justin, how many, how many did call. you? How many did you project for them? I, I might have predicted 27, Carter. I, and, I and like what are they on pace for, Justin? <laughs> I, I have no idea. He now. mentions this every episode. <laughs> I, I really do. <laughs> but I, I just, I, to me, it's just nice to see love out there. Like I, I've, I've missed having him in the lineup, and his presence is definitely a breath of fresh air. And hopefully, as he continues to get healthy and stay healthy, uh, his minutes can go up. And, and the key word there is healthy. And I know fans. Don't like to hear this, but I also know that anybody that is on the J.B. Beaker staff, staff and players are not going to use help as an excuse. But mm-hmm. you mentioned Garland still being in his, in his rookie year. I don't think he's had a consistent minute playing with the same squad on the court. You yeah. know, the Cavs have not only been hit but with injuries, they've been hit with injuries on the same position at the same time for days in a row. So we, there were games we played without a point guard. There were games we played with a power forward. Now we're playing with a center. We have a backup now that, that, is, that, that is starting. So those are the things that when you live in a day-to-day in the NBA, they really have an effect on what the team is able to do or not to do. So mm-hmm. those are the things that the fans have to remember. You know, it's easy to say, I can't believe, you know, they only have this many wins, or I can't believe they're not doing this. But when you look at the whole picture, I think J.B. Bickerstaff and the Cavs, everybody has done an amazing job dealing with the thing. And we haven't even, I think, I don't know, Joe, I might be wrong, but we are one of the teams that have not really been hit by the COVID bug. we just been injured. As, I mean, Delhi just made his debut a week back, a few games, a few games back. I mean, it, it's it's unreal. Kevin hasn't played, you know, played a handful of games this season. Larry Nance was out when he was, you know, just getting into the groove. Jared Allen now is out for a few games on the concussion protocol. So it just keeps adding and adding. So consistency for the coaches to have the rotation, consistency for the players to learn how to play with each other. 
the fact that they have a lack of practice games, a practice days, you know, all the protocols that we are aware of that, but it's very different when you have to leave to wake up every day at 7 30 in the morning whatever you are to get tested but then you can go have breakfast and then you can have breakfast with more than three i mean the whole thing of this season is just i think it, it, it's even a more amazing job that, that jb bickerstaff has been able to do with his staff well I, I thought a big number was the other night when we played utah and uh i think they said we had that was our 22nd or 23rd different starting oh. lineup and the jazz i think had three or four so uh, again, Justin had predicted, I guess, 27 wins before the season. My point being, if you took that team from the starting night and just with say four tweaks to it during the year, that team wins 27 games easily. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. I mean? If you look at, you know, again, Drummond and Love and Sexton and Garland and even a Coro, yeah. if you kind of put them through the year, a healthy season, that team, that's a winning team. That's a competitive team. And you know what, John? And I don't John, even know this, but I don't even know this for a fact, guys. But I would, I would, I would gamble and bet whatever you want that those lineup changes in Utah, at least half of them were caused because of rest on back to back games or or something like that. Because we haven't heard anything about injuries when it comes from, from, from they've Utah. they've been one of the healthiest teams in the league, and and no one and with continuity, by the way. So no wonder they're running running the West right now. Well, and the other part of that is when they played Utah, yeah, it was their 22nd lineup of the season. But at that point, the Cavs had played more games against the West than Utah had. And That's right crazy. now it's even. <laughs> they, they've, right now, Utah has played the same number of games against the East and West as the Cavs have. Like, it oh. is an, a really unbalanced schedule. And you know what? They still might get to 27 wins because they. you look right now and it's they had the toughest schedule in the NBA with all these lineup changes. They're finally starting to get a little healthy. Hopefully, Jared Allen will be back soon. Uh, hopefully, Nancy uh, can, can recover from the illness that he's dealing with. Um, but the, the schedule lightens up and this is always that time of year where the young guys kind of step up. You, you see, uh, Colin Sexton over the last two seasons after the all-star break, really kind of testing what he can do and, uh, building towards what he wants to work on in the off season. It's, it just truly is remarkable that you have this condensed season. It's an unbalanced schedule. It's going to balance out eventually for the most part. And that's what we're going to see from here on out. But 23 different starting lineups when almost no guys have been replaced in the starting lineup as a result of performance. Like the yeah, only time it's, you it's really not like saw JB is hunting for solutions here. And, and, and sometimes I feel like we have seen some swaps, but it's swapping the eighth man for the ninth man in the starting lineup just to try to find something when you right. have very few of your players available. So it, it really has been a, a snake bitten season in a lot of ways. So the fact that it doesn't feel, you know, like a lost cause, I mean, they're what three games out of the plan, three and a half out of the plan. It, it's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I got to ask you, Joe, you know, what are you kind of like, you're, you're following this team a hell of a lot closer than Justin and I are, you know, where I'm in Columbus, Justin's in Winnipeg. You're, you're the kind of the beat writer uh, on, on top of this team. And, you know, what have you really noticed that feels, you know, so different about this compressed schedule? Is it the practice time? Is it fatigue? Um, like, like what feels different to you covering this team uh, closely? Well, I mean, there, there are both of those things for sure. Uh, there's, there's so many factors. You know what? A, a big fact that I, that I thought the other day was you, you don't see, and this is not just the Cavs. This is every team. Brian Winters brought this up one time about how you don't see teams going on certain runs late in games that they normally would have if there was a crowd there. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Pumped in, and there are certain fans. There do there are certain fans allowed in, but that has had an effect, I think, on the game. I really believe there were certain home games that if if uh, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse was really kind of rocking and going nuts. Cavs would have pulled that one out. And again, that's not just a Cavs thing. That's a league thing. Uh, it's curious to see what an effect the, the crowd has had on, on the teams. But uh, that that's one I, I do feel that's been important <laughs> for the year. 
and, and you know, bonding is so important in this league and in any team, I think. And just the fact that the season started where, you know, they couldn't sit more than three guys at a table. And, you know, if you if basically you only you could only hang out with the guy that sits next to you on the plane. And that's the guy that sits next to you at the dinner table. And that's the guy that, I mean, practicing only one per basket with one coach and only four guys in the building at the same time. Uh, th those are the things that matter. In, mm -hmm. this, in, in, the, in this in this day and age. Especially and for a team of 20 year olds. Thing. Yeah, the practice is, is another thing, you know, just just again, the, the, like you mentioned, Carter, the 20 year old, the young kids that want to just watch and learn what, what Kevin and Larry and all these veterans do, what Delhi can share with them. Uh, it is, but again, everybody's going through it. And I think the teams that are going to be more innovative and more able to to come up with, with different things to, to tackle those 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 hurdles are the ones that are going to be even even better next season when everything's supposed to be going back to normal. Kids I feel worst for are the rookie, this un incoming rookie class, not this one coming in, last year's class, uh, Isaac's class, in that they didn't have any of the things that rookies normally get. They, rookies normally have a tournament, and they have their New York draft, and they have a few months to kind of decompress and have summer league, which is very important. Uh, and then training camp. The, this year's rookie class didn't get any of that. So it's really hard to gauge this year's class. You know, people want to rush to do it, but you can't because, again, they had a real, they had a real rough year this year. Well, welcome to the Isaac league, Isaac. Okoro. Here's Kevin Durant. Here's James Harden. <laughs> we're, we're Isaac Okoro. He doesn't get to hang out with me on the road, you know? Well, and that's probably, we're, we're probably the worst matter. thing for him. <laughs> it, 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 I can't imagine how difficult it is because there's an adjustment. Like people know the rookie wall where you go from a certain schedule in college, you have more rest days, you have more practice. And then the grind of the NBA season almost always takes a toll on these guys. But now that schedule is even more condensed. You're playing four games in six nights. Uh, you might have two days off and guess what? You're playing four days and six, four games and six nights again. And uh, like, especially for a draft class that, a lot of people kind of said coming in, it's a weaker class, which in my opinion, weaker class to me just means needs a little more work that these guys maybe aren't as polished in year one, but you often see it all becomes player development. These guys are talented. Everyone progresses at different stages. So the fact that someone isn't polished at 18 or 19 years old doesn't necessarily rule them out from being a significant contributor. And it, it was interesting that after Miami, you have one of those guys that took kind of a longer road, uh, to becoming a very good player in Jimmy Butler um, point out, Hey, Isaac Okoro really impressed me. He, he's someone that works really hard. He doesn't take any possessions off uh, really competes on the defensive end of the floor. Like what he shows that he makes the right pass, the right reads. And yeah, m maybe people would like to see more raw numbers from him, but it is interesting that you have a veteran like Jimmy Butler and Udonis Haslam uh, point out, Hey, you can see the flashes, those guys that have been through the ringer and have been through this player development process. They see it. They, they recognize that kind of potential when, when it's in front of them. And Jimmy actually even said like, you know, he's, he's a, he only had a year in college. I, I had three at Marquette. I think it was three or four. Like when, when at, at Isaac's current age, Jimmy was still playing college ball. So, mm -hmm. and, and he still took a minute to develop into the player he was going to be. So it is really, really hard to be patient, especially with a guy like Isaac, who, you know, one thrown to the wolves every single night. So like, it's going to look bad for him on some nights where a superstar just, you know, takes his lunch. Cause that's what some superstars, that's what superstars have been doing since the dawn of the NBA. And then <laughs> the, then his offensive game is relatively limited, but you know, you're starting to see you're starting to see those flashes, and you know, I think he's I want to say he's nine of his last like ten from the field. He's starting to kind of figure it out on offense. What do you What do you hear when you when you talk to folks uh, within the organization uh, about uh, Isaac and kind of his trajectory? Well, I mean, yesterday, for example, yesterday morning before shooter, I, I asked uh, Coach Bickerstaff about the rookie wall. Had he hit it? Uh, and he said, and I said, what, what do you do to <clears throat> kind of get him over it or through it or whatever you do? And he said, you, you just got to fight through it. And he is. Yeah. But again, certain nights, his numbers, you know, Justin, you brought it up his raw numbers look bad and certainly mm -hmm. does struggle from the field, but man, it, really, I believe that that is one kid you do not have to worry about. 
he's got an NBA body. He's got an NBA mindset. He's again. And he's not. And by, I've said whoa. this a few times. He's not NBA strong yet, even though he's NBA body. He's going to get big and strong because, like, you know, he's still a kid. Like, grown men can still move his ass around. But, like, when he ages into that frame, he's going to be an absolute monster physically. A monster. I mean, right. Again, he'll grow into a – he'll really grow into an NBA body. Imagine him by 21 or 22, a young man, a really young man, uh, Jared Allen's age or, you know, Colin's age. Imagine after all he's gone through, how good he'll be on both ends. And again, it's not like he can't do it. You've seen him. You've seen him splash three pointers. You've seen him really be creative around the rim. He's 19. He's playing against grown men. Uh, I really believe there's nothing to worry about with that kid. And one last thing about you asked what the word around the organization. I also asked him yesterday, um, uh, Tori and Prince about him. And, you know, that it hasn't been much fun guarding all these tough guys night after night. And he said, this is the most fun. He said, because essentially he's kind of saying you're playing with house money and that you're not really expected to do much offensively, but really you get to tighten up against LeBron and James Harden. Nobody is expecting you to do much, you know, on that side, on the offensive side. So you can just lock down and learn. And uh, really, like I said, I, 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 I'm, I'm impressed by that kid this year. I really am. Do you also ask Darren Prince how did Yale have rebounded Baylor? <laughs> <laughs> Look up a classic moment in the NCAA. <laughs> that is one of my favorite posts. Like oh, yes. that that is by far like I, that has to be the nightmare of anybody ever asking questions is that you're going to get clipped in a moment like that where maybe the wording didn't come out just right or you were a little too brief in the question you asked and it resulted in an answer like that from Tori and Prince that's one of my you know, favorite be a moments. good story like a good like weird ESPN story because I've read stories about like uh I've read stories about people who wound up in memes, like little kids, they'd cry mm. like, crying on video or like the, the girl at Clemson that looks just like Trevor Lawrence. Oh yeah. <laughs> I would like to like ask, it'd be interesting to find sports reporters that were on the other end of tirades. Mm. I mean, like who's the guy, what was the guy that asked the playoffs question or who's the guy that made Hal McCray flip out? I, I remember when, uh, question. yeah, I remember when, when you Carlisle. were on the other end of, and, and, and you know, Bill Parson. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. The hey, we do that. Do that. We just guys have gotten, you know, I mean, you've been there when uh, Kenny, where LeBron will check Kenny Rota in front of everybody. And it's kind of embarrassing, but you know, Kenny loves that. Let's do, let's do that project. I think that that's, a, that's an amazing project. <laughs> I, that would be a, a lot of fun to check out with, with, with Okoro. The, the thing that really stands out to me is by all accounts, like the work ethic is off the charts. And I feel like I went through some growing pains with Colin where it's okay. Really raw coming in. Uh, he has this great work ethic, but and, fr and frankly, the, the we didn't like the pick. So we, he had to win us over. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I was not, I was not a fan. I didn't like him picking Kyrie's number that uh, for petty reasons, I was sitting there being like, oh man, I, I just, I wish that all those numbers from the championship team, uh, kind of stayed with those guys, but the way that he just worked and turned himself into just a hell of a player. Like I was getting messages from uh, people from Miami heat beat and uh, the, the people that cover the heat and saying, wow, like Colin is just, he's so much fun. He's so talented. He's so uh, poised as a scorer and he's improved as a passer. So betting on guys that have that kind of a work ethic to me, that's easy. Like, I will just give them time. Yes, you can get a little impatient at times because it feels like this team is close. Like we talked about what this could be if this team was healthy and that kind of will breed a culture of impatience. But for the most part, like I'm, I'm still enjoying the ride with him. Like I I'm, I'm willing to give him a, a summer and, and see how he does next year and how he progresses. Cause it, it's a gradual process as much as we want to speed things up. And as much as we want a microwave player development, it takes time. Rafa, I, I, I want to ask you this, um, kind of what you think calling calling this team all year. We know that their home road splits are hilarious. I mean, like crazy. The, one of the worst road teams in NBA history and like pretty solid at home. You know, I think they're 
I think on our last pod, we said their their net rating at home is like minus 3.3. Their net rating on the road is like minus 14, like an <laughs> unfathomably bad number. And I guess my question for you is, do you think that this team is more, you know, their, ref, their reality is more reflective of who they are at home or who they are on the road, or is it somewhere in the middle right now? You know, considering the season that we've been talking about, it's really hard to judge what's happening on the road. It, I mean, I'm telling you guys, that's what we're forget hoping. About, forget about everything that is going on. On a normal season, traveling with the team as a broadcaster, where I burn two calories calling a game, I am burnt the next day when we have to play a back to back from Indiana to New York City arriving mm -hmm. at 2.30 in the morning and then playing the next day. But there's no shoot around. It's just getting up and, and going to the game, getting on the bus at 3.34 p.m. So it's hard for me to say that they're not who, you know, they are who they are at home but not on the road because the, the, the road has changed so much this year. I'll give you an example. And, I, again, it's not an excuse, but the, going with the, you know, with the question that Carter asked, the tests are given – at the arena on the on the home team, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really nice for the people that come to Cleveland that stay two and a half blocks from Rock and Mortgage Fieldhouse. So they have to take the test, bring it to the Fieldhouse, and then they bring it back with the results. And after the results are, are, are obtained, they can continue with breakfast with everything that's going on. When you travel to Orlando, you stay in a half hour away from the arena. <laughs> A half hour there and a half hour coming back plus whatever it takes to get the tests done. So you're talking about your morning being just totally ruined. And 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 so then these guys are animals of routine. You know, mm -hmm. they like to do the same things in the morning, they like to do the same thing, the same lunch, the nap, the game day nap, and all of that. So it's really hard to judge Carter uh, what, what this team means on the road because the road has changed so much i mean it, it changed at home as well because you know for a more for one point they couldn't even leave the house they can they can go anywhere but the house to the arena and to own training facility so i think it has a lot to do with that and and i, I don't know i don't know if you agree with me joe but it, it's hard to judge and and use that uh, not as an excuse but it's definitely a factor on how the teams are behaving on the road you know the the lakers i know started winning their first what 13 road games but they were the lakers with with lebron james and anthony davis well, that and helps it changes when, <laughs> <laughs> when you take those two players out of, out of the equation but the road is hard i'm telling you man when we come back from those 10 day road trips and we have that day off the once we arrive at three o'clock in the morning and for some reason it's always snowing in cleveland and when you come back at three in the morning it, it's it's a whole different monster the play the p i I wish, I wish fans would appreciate a lot more what it takes to play two games in back-to-back -back nights because it is a monster for the body and for the mind. And I'm telling you for myself that I, all I have to do is prepare, read, and get ready for the broadcast. I don't have to run up in the morning, up and down, and come back the next day to do it. Well, I'll say this because it, it's funny that you mentioned that you know fans should should you know understand you know try to understand better. I do think talking to you know team of you know, people who travel with the team or that are more intimately connected with the players than Justin and I are is really, really valuable because, you know, we don't see the commute to the Amway Center and back, you know, like there, there's yeah. no way for us. To, I, that actually really like I, I really like perked up when you were telling that story because we don't have that kind of visibility. So I think this I think the more and more we understand what this year has been for these players, we're going to meet realize more and more that like not to throw it away because you know all, all data is data you know you never want to throw away data points but you do have to couch stuff and it's not excuses it's it's understanding co context yeah it's and context guys, and you guys are the guys that know this but i would like to see the stats for the whole league on the road this year mm -hmm. and i would like to see those comparisons that you just throw with the cap to see how it how it compares to everybody else on the league and i would bet that not many teams have the same or better on the road than they have at home because it, it is a whole different monster this year. Yeah, like right. that's what makes it tough to evaluate this season. Like even saying, hey, the Cavs are this team at home. Well, other teams are on the road when the Cavs are at home, right? Like even though it's not the same commute you might have in other cities, they are still at, in a disadvantaged position as well. So there's just so much context every single way. I always say this is like a Rorschach test of NBA seasons where there's so much context. There's so many different ways you can view things. You just see what you want to see, baby. 
if you're trying to be objective, it, it's it's tough to find that normal middle ground, especially with an unbalanced schedule. I'll give you another example. We had Mark Cashman on the on, on the on the One and Go Radio podcast. Who is, he's the head of operation. I don't know what his his title is, but the, the whole bottom line is that if he guy if that guy disappears one day on the road, you can forget about the rest of the team <laughs> throwing up at the arena and having a meal or whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> getting the right uniforms on. I mean, what if Mark Cashman is not in the equation on the road or at home, he's gone. He was telling us, for example, that first of all, there's different protocols in the different cities that you go to. When they go to Boston, they can't even have a, a ballroom to have dinner. They have to get the food and go back to the room to eat it because that's the protocol in the state of Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. When you go to, to Florida, obviously in Florida, you <laughs> do whatever you want. Matter, right? they, yeah. didn't, they didn't have a pandemic. You, right? you, can, you can feed <laughs> each class, other. You can, right? you, yeah. can just, you, can, <laughs> but, you can baby bird it. Yeah, but at hotels, <laughs> you know, speaking about being animals of routine and doing, getting your work done, getting your weights done, They've been doing walkthroughs in ballrooms. They've been having gym brought up into a ballroom and just basically probably have the, the same gym set up that the ladies had at the, in the final four at, <laughs> at the NCAA because they have to bring them into a hotel room because they, if there are guests in the hotel where the cats are staying, they, the hotel cannot close the gym the gym just for the fan, just for the team. So they, they don't have access to the team, to the gym because of the protocol with the NBA. So it, there's so many different angle to look at this road uh, performance that I think I, I would definitely say that it has something to do with, with, the, with the discrepancy from home and away. And, and a lot of it has to do with how young the guys are in that, Rafa, you mentioned that, it, you know, really, and we are too. Rafa and I sit next to each other on the plane and we're, your creature's a habit. If, if you get off the plane and somebody's sitting on your seat on the bus, all of a sudden, just everything goes haywire and you feel like killing that person. The point is, on the road, everything is routine and it's a long season. And that's there's a reason for that. You do the same thing all the time. These young guys, they're 19, 20, 21, 22. They haven't been doing this. Guys like uh, LeBron, seasoned teams, they know the road. They don't need shoot around. They don't need to go to the gym all the time. They don't need to be told where to go and all that stuff. They know pregame meals, all that stuff. For the young guys, everything is kind of screwed up for them. I mean, everything is kind of weird for them. They don't get the same normal routine. So again, that does matter. I don't know how big of a factor it is. I don't know how many points it's worth, but I'm just saying that for the young guys on the road, this is a weird thing for them. And life on the road is already hard enough. Uh, Throwing this in makes it that much more difficult for them, for young guys. Uh, I remember my first year on the road. Ralph, I'm sure, remembers his first year on the road. (laughs) It's confusing, man, and weird and intimidating. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying life on the road. (laughs) You mentioned the Amway Center. Throw in Disney traffic on the weekends. <laughs> You're stuck on the, you know, and, and I was hung over on that bus ride one time, and it was horrible. <laughs> what about the time in New York where we they had to take the subway because it took us 45 minutes to go to the lodge in New York City? Huh? Right. It, right. It, so. it is just unreal. But uh, by the way, I if, if I thought my the road was so much fun on my first trip that it was just going to get better, and it just it just never got better than that. So. <laughs> well, then it becomes a little more routine, right? And uh, I, I, especially when you look at the young guys dealing with the lack of continuity, like you're, it's already such a new environment for them. Jared Allen's full time starter for the first time, a Coral first NBA season. Like there's so many firsts on this team that, yeah, a team with continuity is going to handle that kind of adversity better than the Cavs are going to, which is mm-hmm. just reality. But this is why we really appreciate having you guys on, giving this type of insight. Uh, we don't know what the giving, hell we're talking about. Yeah, we, we can sound we can sound really <laughs> confident in what we're saying, and like that's ninety percent of it. But uh, to to actually get people on that that have this insight is incredibly valuable, and and we really really appreciate. It. Talk, about, talk about routine. The thing that I miss really on the road is the the piracy that used to go on on the plane with movies and stuff going. On. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't watched a movie in. A year. When I got on that plane the first time, I remember American Sniper had just come out. And I kept watching the computer screens and everybody was watching American Sniper. And the movie wasn't even in the theater yet. <laughs> then I discovered there was a, a hard drive going around. Rafa, like, Rafa, we're <laughs> live. We got 
cut it. <laughs> and, of course, and of course, I ended up being the holder of El Diablo. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? All publicity is good publicity. So uh, when, when the team gets fined uh, for piracy, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that'll that be great exposure for this podcast. But I want to thank you guys both so much for coming on. We really, really do appreciate it. And for all our listeners, if you guys want to get more insight uh, like this, make sure you guys are checking out the Wine and Gold Radio podcast. Uh, we'll, you guys have a lot of fun on there and, and provide this kind of insight. So uh, before I wrap this thing up, uh, anything else that you guys would, would like to let people know about or, or promote? I have two things. Two okay. things for me is one, uh, listen to the Wine and Gold Radio. I mean, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. And also, we got to have you guys on our show. That's the next thing. It's a serious grilling. We're gonna get. We're gonna really put you guys through the ringer. And then Let's the go. second thing is when the Cavs win their twenty seventh game, Justin. I think you. Sh- I think there should be some kind of parade or like a street named after you in Winnipeg yeah. or something because now I know that that's the magic number that, that is the bar and, and if they land on 20, of you man and if they <laughs> land on 27 I think he's going to retire I think yeah. I think that's the end of it I, I, I have a few things first of all yeah I listen to Wine and Gold Radio but I want to hear the, especially you Canadian fans what do they think of my <laughs> I want to sing all Canada when the, when, the, when the Raptors come to the to the, to the field house and what do we? What is that? Was it the last episode, Joe? That we mm-hmm. that I sang O Canada mm-hmm. on the air. Well, yeah, that. yeah. And second of all, I've been working with podcasts since they were called before they were called podcasts. And I think for the Chase Down Pod to be considered at the top, you gotta have one of my calls in the open. I think it's just I've been discriminated by the Chase Down Pod. <laughs> I, I would actually like to. Uh, I would like to uh, blame the Cavaliers media department. Uh, we yeah. we had no say in the matter. I think that uh, we we will uh, air your grievance appropriately, and yeah. we will get this resolved, Ralph. We, we we will we will follow the uh, the proper channels for that yeah. one. But uh, I I can't I can't disagree. I, I think it would really it, it's, add a, it's an egregious oversight. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Rafa and Joe, thank you so much for coming on. And big thanks to all our listeners as well. If you guys are watching on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe. If you're listening via podcast, do the same thing you should do for Wine and Gold Radio and all other podcasts you love, which is leave a rating, leave a review, subscribe, unsubscribe, and resubscribe, and help cook those books. Take advantage of Apple's broken metrics. Uh, if you guys want to be part of the Chase Down Discord, you can send a screenshot of that review to chasedownpod at gmail.com, and we'll send you a link to the Discord. However you choose to support us, we really do appreciate it. Make sure you guys are staying safe out there. And until next time, go Cavs.